Again, good morning. Welcome to Tea Talk. Mr. Stone, our technical director, will introduce our guest speaker. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you being here. This is a really good turnout. Thank you. So I'm Rob Stone. I'm the executive director here at White Sands. Um, what I'd like to do is inter introduce Mr. Garrett Lambert, known as Gary around here. Dr. Lambert is the director of the Research and Analysis Center. And some of you may know that that's a tenant activity here on White Sands. So Gary leads a, a, a pretty diverse group of analysts over there that, that function on analytical tasks, and they are actually part of AFC. So without further ado, Gary. Thanks. We'll see the, the applause level is the same at the end of this, but uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, I don't do well in heat, so if I start sweating stuff like that, don't hold it against me. I appreciate uh, the introduction, uh, Rob, and uh, I wanted to um, spend some time today. And I, uh, okay, so a little story. So Josie Tate, uh, I don't know where she's hiding, there she's hiding over there. So she's been trying to corral me in to give her a title for this talk. And finally last week she said, I, I got to have it so I can send out the note. And so I had about five seconds that I was do reflections on leadership. And then the next day as I looked at it, I was like, man, that sounds grandiose. That's a little bit over the top. Um, but I want to do today uh, is first provide you a little bit of context, both uh, about our, our organization called TRAC uh, here on White Sands, a little bit about myself so you understand where I've come from, and then kind of relate to you based on my experiences, uh, some things, I call them actions and attributes uh, that you might consider uh, as you uh, go on that journey to continue to refine yourself as a, as a better human being and a better leader. So I'll start with TRAC. So uh, the Research and Analysis Center has been here at White Sands a long time. So there's a track Wismer element here. Um, there's another uh, main uh, center up at uh, Fort Leavenworth, so there's a track Fort Leavenworth or track Fliven. And then there's uh, two, two uh, on, on the left and right coast, if you will, two small elements. So on the left coast, uh, we got track Monterey, which is uh, a very small element that's co-located with Naval Postgraduate School. And uh, they have about seven military orses, so we call them FA-49s, but basically operations research and systems analysis, and then one civilian uh, 1515, GS 1515. And then on the right coast, we got a slightly larger uh, footprint, about 30 odd folks, civilian and military, co-located with a sustainment center of excellence and so forth at, I'll get it wrong, Fort Abbott. I th no, I got it wrong. Anyway, I can't remember, Fort Lee. I'll just say that for now until I remember the right name. Um, and they're, they're co-located there because they do mostly logistical and sustainment, sustainment analysis. So TRAC um, started here, TRAC White Sands started here under the name uh, TRADOC uh, Analysis Support Agency, TRASANA. And a, a like uh, capability was, was formed up at uh, Fort Leavenworth, Keora in uh, I think 3 October of 1989. Uh, so we've been here for 35 years. And TRASANA then became TRAC T-R-A-C, where this time it meant TRADOC Analysis Command, because at the time it was uh, commanded by a one-star uh, GO. And then about four years later in 1993, it became TRAC, in this case, TRADOC Analysis Center, because it was uh, directed by a SES. And that journey is continuing, because we're on our third rendition of the name, because you heard uh, Mr. Stone maybe talk about it, and, and there's a little story there about what our real name is again, but we still kept the brand. And the brand's important because track was known, but the, the words that the letters stood for didn't matter as much. And so um, we're currently in AFC, the Army Futures Command, and General Murray was the, the commanding general at the time as we were coming over from TRADOC to go to uh, AFC. And we were worried about losing the brand because our name meant TRADOC Analysis Center. And we're in now the Army Futures Command. And so we wanted to keep the same acronym. And so uh, we came up with the Research and Analysis Center, a little, little hoity-toity, I guess, and so forth. But um, it turns out that General Murray was a graduate and a rabid fan of the Ohio State University. <laughs> and we had him at the. So uh, it's now the Research and Analysis Center. Um, some of the work we do, and so um, we uh, uh, basically our mission is to conduct uh, uh, to produce, I guess is the best way to put it, produce relevant, um, objective, and credible analysis, operations analysis to support or inform leader decisions. That's our mission. And so uh, our workforce consists of ORSAs, 
both civilian and military, some contractors, so we're about 150 folks uh, that uh, reside here at White Sands. And, um, you know, the, the history we have is 35 years. In fact, we, we had our 35th anniversary last year. Uh, a very proud heritage, I would say. Um, we have the work we do, and maybe some of you know what analyses of alternatives are. So we're, we're the organization in the Army that does the ACAT one, so the high dollar uh, studies that are associated with, you know, how do you replace a Bradley? How do you replace the, the tank? You know, those kinds of things. Uh, we also do a lot of specialized analysis. And one of the things that's kept me here for so many years uh, is, that, is the work changes all the time. The content of the work, we've done everything from the gender integration study. So TRAC was the, uh, the agency that did that. Uh, through, as I said, AOAs to other studies and uh, the one that's uh, consuming my life right now. How many of you heard of Project Convergence? Probably a lot of you. Yeah, so Project Convergence started out two years ago. I have to say this now because I'm going to refer to it later. And um, it, it uh, started out really small, about 10 technologies, Army only, out at uh, Yuma uh, Proving Ground. And then uh, last year we said, you know what, we we got to do it. We got to make this harder. And so we made it joint. Uh, and then we kind of had it at Yuma as well as here at White Sands. Some of you might have been involved in that. Uh, and that was uh, pretty hard to do, pretty hard to pull off. So we're the I am the lead um, data collection and analysis uh, dude for the entire effort. So that includes not only Army analysis, but our joint. And then this year coming up. Uh, in 22, we have uh, other nations involved as well. So we went from 21 and we, we upped it in 22. So now we included another two nations, UK and Australia. And then we also uh, included um, uh, the joint again, of course. And then we decided that, you know, we only had a couple sites last year. Let's have, I don't know, 30 from, starting from the NTC. There's a, there's a scenario B we're calling it. Think, think Europe focused. And let's have, you know, uh, across the world sites, uh, I think it's on the order of 13 to 15 uh, for scenario A, we're calling it, which is uh, Indo-PACOM based, okay? And so um, we have over 300 data collection and analysts uh, folks that, that are in our team from across the entire joint force. I just left our, we're in the middle of a IPR in progress review and a, a rehearsal of concept drill uh, over at our, at our uh, location. Uh, the Brits were uh, briefing uh, their, their plan as I left. And so we've got everybody under the tent. And so and one of the things I'm going to talk to you about is teams, right, in terms of uh, building a team of teams. And so I'll talk about that later. So and the last thing I'll say about track, and I'll just give you some, uh, some background on myself a little bit, don't worry, very short, um, is uh, I mentioned the, the pride in our history and pride in our accomplishments. It just turns out this week, every year, there's kind of two uh, analytic um, symposia or uh, meetings or conferences, if you will, it happened. They're really fun, by the way, you should, you should come down. They're very exciting. Talk a lot about analysis and statistical significance. I don't see any takers, but um, so AORS is the Army Operations Research Symposium. That, that's going on this week right now up at uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground. And then there's another one, which so that's Army only. And then there's another one, it's, it's, it's joint. So it's more as it's the Military Operations Research Society Symposium, which is usually in the spring. And um, it turns out this week, uh, one of our former directors here at Track White Sands, uh, uh, Ms. Donna Vargas, uh, was inducted into the Orsa Hall of Fame. First female director uh, ever in Track, uh, and also the first female ever inducted in the Orsa Hall of Fame. That's pretty cool. And so we're very proud of her and her uh, contributions, and also finally being you know, put into the Orsa Hall of Fame. And then there's another thing why I call it the Academy Award for analysis for, our, for the Army. It's, it's named Wilbur B. Payne um, and an interesting fellow from way back when in terms of the, the 60s and 70s. That's 1960s and 70s. And um, he uh, that award is, like I said, like it's, it's for the, the best analysis in the Army for that year. And we also won that uh, at Track White Sands for a counter small UAS study. So very proud of the things that as a team that we've accomplished over the years to include uh, most recently this week. Uh, a little bit about me. So um, I'm not, you know, some kind of super leader or anything. That's why I felt like when I read Reflections on Leadership, dude, you, you're not that guy. Uh, so I, 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 I have some experience, though. So I came into the Army in 1980. I see the calculators worrying. So damn, that dude's old. Yeah, I'm old. I'm old. Um, but um, I started out uh, as an infantry officer and uh, went through my career. And uh, I think uh, that experience is only a piece of it, and I've learned a lot more about leadership since I left the Army in the green suit. 
I retired uh, from the Army in uh, 2010 on a Friday. And on a Monday, I came in wearing a brand new uh, men's warehouse suit, top of the line, trust me. And, uh, and then became the, uh, the director of, of Track White Sands. And so I've been there since. So um, to me, um, my experiences, I think, uh, both in the Army and in, in, in uh, working with uh, this, this great organization, Track White Sands, uh, has helped me to see some things, helped me to observe things. And that's what I want to impart to you today, just, just some things that, you know, I wish I told my 20, 30, 40, I'll stop there, self, um, that uh, I, if I had just done this a little differently, you know, I could have been a better leader. And so I think um, what I'm going to show you today are just some things from my perspective that I think are some key actions you could take today and uh, in your lives today. And then also some some key attributes. I didn't want to give you a laundry list. There's only seven total. So about four actions, three attributes. But I think there's some things that I think that will resonate with you. And um, before I move on, I forgot to say um, so. Ask questions anytime you want to. Uh, unfortunately, for those who are on the uh, outstations, uh, we don't have the capacity, I think, to get the uh, the questions typed in. So, uh, so I'm not sure if that'll come back up at all. The gang will tell me in the back if it does. But you know, raise your hand and ask a question during. I'd rather you ask it, you know, when it's proximate to the the crime, than have to wait at the end and try to remember why you, why you wanted to ask it. Okay. So, I need to control this. It is really hot in here. So my grandiose title. So I, I got a, a, a message for you, OK? And, and I really believe this. So people are born and leaders are made. There's a lot of the debate, nurture versus nature. Um, does, uh, does our people, uh, are leaders born? And you just, if you don't have it, then you don't have it. Uh, and you can't become one. And, and I'm firmly not in that camp. I believe all of us are leaders. In fact, Think about yourselves in your private lives, for example, your leaders in your families, your leaders in your communities. You could be a, a soccer coach uh, you're in a religious group. Um, you could be a leader in the workplace, too, not, not just by, by position either, right? We have informal leaders. And so I think all of us have some flavor, some taste of leadership. And the question is, what are you going to do about it to be a better leader? And so some of the things I want to talk about are some things I think to spur your thoughts along those lines. So I, I said I'd start with actions. And again, these could be turned into attributes, but I decided not to just give you a laundry list of attributes of leadership uh, as far as I'm concerned. So um, first one has to do with one of the most important ones, build the right culture. Uh, there's a quote from Jack Welch that says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I love that quote because I think sometimes we spend too much effort on um, Designing a strategy. What's our organization's strategy for this year? And, uh, you know, just like uh, I think any of you who have been in the military, uh, no plan survives contact with the enemy and no strategy survives the next day, in my opinion. Um, and so what's more important is the culture that you want to have in your organization. And uh, there's a guy named uh, E.B. Taylor, who was a uh, British anthropologist for, uh, from the 18th century, who originally coined the word culture. And he gave a definition of it, but I'm not going to read it to you because it's, it's kind of long. But uh, I think I want to talk more about things I think all you know, which is workplace culture. What are the, the, the components of a workplace culture? Well, there's things like the character and person. It's the character and personality of your organization. But it's a series of, of things like um, your shared values, how you communicate with each other, um, your purpose. Um, your work ethic, all these different things, your, the values you have, not only for you know, the work you're doing, but your, your, your more uh, ethical, or if you want to call them uh, uh, personal values, right, in terms of right, wrong, ethics, and so forth. So um, I think if you think about it, building the right culture is very difficult because, first of all, you have to know what the purpose is. There's a guy named uh, Simon Sinek. Anybody heard of him? He, he, he did a, um, I think it's a uh, TED talk called, um, what's that? Start with why. Very good. Tristan gets a, he gets a bonus there. So <laughs> yeah, start with why. And if you think about how most organizations or industry or companies, whatever you want to call it, define their culture and what and their organization and what it does, they start with what? Hey, I do good analysis. 
How? Well, I got a lot of smart people and we do some, you know, statistical uh, calculations and so forth. When they get to the why, it's the last thing they talk about. And usually it's kind of muted. and It's behind the stuff, you know, the other stuff you said. But in Cynic's you know, presentation, you start with why. Why the heck are we here? What is our purpose? Why do we exist as an organization? That's where you start. And that's where you build a culture to meet that purpose. And you get the right people on board so that they can uh, not only uh, execute what you need to do, but they can do it a lot better without a lot of hands on, eyes off, hands on. So um, the fundamental question and you need to be able to answer as an organization is why do you exist? What, you, what, what is your purpose? And then from that, everything flows. I may run out of water, Gunga Din. So, um, some examples. And, and uh, I'll use sometimes historical, sometimes uh, stuff that, that I've observed in our organization, not to tout it or anything, but just that's my experience. And so, uh, a couple things to talk about. There. So, um, I said to you before, you know, Track's mission is to produce relevant, objective, and credible operations analysis to inform leaders. Does that grab you? Are you jazzed by that? Ho hum. You're a tough crowd. I'm gonna I'm gonna break you. <laughs> so I always felt like, yeah, mission is nice, but it doesn't say the why. It doesn't say why we exist. And so if I was gonna change that, and this is my opinion, not a track opinion, but I was gonna you got a question? Okay. I was gonna uh, if I was gonna change that, I said we exist to ensure that our soldiers never have a fair fight. And our only shareholder are the soldiers. So that's why we exist in track. We do the, the kinds of analyses I was talking to you about. Well, how do we equip the soldiers? How should they be trained? And all those things that go into the equation so that we're more effective and have overmatch over the other side. So that's why we exist. So culture each, uh, each strategy uh, for breakfast. So I'll, I'll uh, move on to the next one. So uh, create a team of teams. I read a lot of books. I like reading and um, I have a lot of time traveling on planes and, and basically uh, waiting for flights to be canceled, you know, every 15 minutes and all that kind of stuff. And so I spent a lot of time reading and um, one of the ones I came across and part of it had to do because of a course I got to go to with a, a group called the McChrystal Group. And so if any of you uh, remember General Stanley McChrystal, pretty famous at the at the end, I guess, of his career for obvious reasons, but also very famous in the Army during his career. Um, and uh, he's written a book called Team of Teams. And one of the things that's in there, one of the central things is you want to build a team of teams, not a tribe of tribes. And, and let me talk about the kind of context for this book and then try to explain some of the things I think that came out of it, at least for me, that might resonate with you. So the problem he was addressing at the time was that he was a Joint Special Operations Commander in Iraq. Uh, he was there five years as the commander. So he was there from 2003 to 2008 uh, in Iraq. And then later he, he became the commander out in Afghanistan and, and many of you know about that. But um, as he was, and so, so think about this. So the Joint Special Operations Commander has the SEALs, Delta, Rangers, Paras, all kinds of different, you know, three letter agencies, every one of them underneath uh, his umbrella. And none of them talked to each other. They all had their distinct cultures. They didn't like each other in many cases. They wanted to outdo each other, you know, especially the, the special operators, right? Uh, and so his whole problem was he had a hierarchical organization with him at the top and you go down, you know, one of the block and line diagrams and then over here you got the seals and all those were silos. No one's talking to each other. No one's sharing information. No one's making decisions at those levels because they had to go up their chain of command, not the one to General McChrystal, but back to you know Washington DC or wherever their headquarters was. The enemy, on the other hand, was this terrorist network that had cells with lots of connections, small teams, very agile. In fact, even with all the uh, you know intelligence we had, at the time, and uh, as he relates in his book, you know, our capabilities were much better. We couldn't make decisions fast enough because of all those silos. And so he, he felt like his job was to take that hierarchical structure. You've all seen block and line diagrams. 
and turn it into something more like what the, the, the terrorist network looked like, but turn it on its head in the sense of building these, these team of teams where individual teams have a great, do a great job of uh, having a purpose, a known purpose. There's relationships, you know each other to your left and right. Uh, and, and they're able to act more quickly because they're making decisions at their level. And he was trying to figure out how, how do you raise that goodness of a small team to the enterprise level? like he was at with all those different agencies. And so I'll you know, belabor the book, but two of the things that come across to me that I think are, are um, that resonate are the ideas of shared consciousness and empowered decision-making. In other words, pushing, pushing decision-making down. Empowered execution is another thing he called it. And let me talk about those two things for a second. Um, historian type stuff here, so history stuff. So uh, anybody ever heard of uh, Admiral Nelson in the Battle of Trafalgar, Navy? Any Navy people in here? All right, yeah, you don't count. <laughs> so um, in 1805, uh, one of the most definitive uh, sea, sea battles in, in uh, UK history, British at the time, uh, was, was fought between uh, Admiral Horatio Nelson and his fleet against a combined fleet from the French and the uh, Spanish off uh, Cadiz in a place called Tra uh, Trafalgar. And a lot's made of the outcome of that battle. Uh, Nelson ended up being killed by a sniper, didn't survive. Um, but if any of you have ever been to, to London and seen going to Trafalgar Square, they put him that high up there for a reason because that's where they think he is, damn near to God, you know, uh, because he saved the empire. And, um, but people talk more about his tactics, the crossing the T, right, TW, and, and the things that he did that were different and, and, and won the day because they were outnumbered against the, uh, the, the French and the, and the Spanish. But people think that that just happens. But Nelson spent years with his captains, working with them, helping to understand how he thought, working to have, build relationships across all those captains working to, to help them to understand how to make decisions in the absence of direction or orders. And if you can imagine in 1805, no cell phones, a little semaphore if you can see it through the smoke, uh, you know, those kinds of things. And so very difficult to, to um, um, get information across after contact is made. And so his idea was, I need to train all of these captains, the line captains, to, to be able to think like me and to execute without me telling them what to do. And that's how it ended up being, being the way it was. And so it took years to do that, to build that shared consciousness, to help them with empowered execution, which was not very typical of that era. You know, everybody, it was a hierarchy, hierarchy big time for the rest of the Navy, uh, the British Navy, but he was different. But it took years to do it. Just like building a team of teams takes years to do because it's about trust. It's about relationships too, as well as that shared consciousness. You don't get that sitting in a cubicle next to each other. You don't get that, you know, just uh, talking or a few sensing sessions. It's got to be something you purposefully work your way through, purposefully try to build your teams, purposely create an environment with that trust so people can question, can ask real truth questions, not just ask the ones that are safe, right? Um, there's a quote, you know, it's, it's, a, it's basically uh, the last instructions that, that Nelson gave to his captains, which was essentially, uh, no, ca no captain can do far wrong if he puts his ship alongside that of the enemy. That was his final orders to them. Other than something like, uh, England's watching you today, so don't, don't mess it up. Um, but um, the French Admiral, Vice Admiral uh, Villeneuve, I think his name was, um, who was defeated, he lived uh, after the battle, but they were completely defeated, um, said that day, all captains were Nelsons because he had in 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 implicated them with that notion of shared understanding, shared, uh, shared responsibility, the ability to make their own decisions, and they won the day. So that's one example. Um, when I first came to track in uh, 2006, I was a military deputy there, and um, one of the things I noticed right away, so I mentioned to you before, track has four different centers, uh, left coast, right coast, living here. And um, especially between the two main, main centers, so 100, about 150 at Flippin, 150 here at Track White Sands. Um, 
there was divides and it wasn't just geographical. I always said, yeah, it's a tyranny of geography. No, it was culture too. Um, just down, I think, Dyer Street's that way. Just down Dyer Street, if you look to the left before you get to the T intersection at the other end, um, there's some, uh, I think there's historical buildings, but um, there used to be a whole bunch of rocket scientists over there uh, back in the set late 70s, early 80s. And uh, there's, there's the strategic arms limitation talks going on. Uh, the last one, the second one ended uh, in 79. And a lot of those are between the United States and the Soviet Union. And so we, we here at White Sands had, had these rocket scientists looking at assessments of the Soviet Union in terms of, you know, what, what if they went after us in a, in a nuclear uh, capacity? You know, what's the exchange gonna look like and all those kinds of computations? Well, once most of those talks kind of changed how, how that uh, calculus was done and also the treaties in place that they had, there was no need for the rocket scientists anymore here. And so uh, one day the leader of that, that group, who I think might've been Wilbur B. B. Payne, the award I was talking about, called the TRADOC commander and said, hey, I got about 300 rocket scientists here. Do you want any? And that became Trasana, which is now TRAC. From that start, uh, talking again about you know the, the kinds of folks you have in culture, as I said before, and in a team of teams. That's where uh, our culture came from. We're, we're very uh, detail-oriented modeling and simulation and, and uh, statistical analysis that we do here. Fort Leavenworth's different, and so we're we're down from you know soldier up to about brigade level operations. What we look at, they look from about brigade up to core division, and so their their mindset's different because of where they came from up there, at Fort Leavenworth, and what the original folks were. Uh, uh, where they came from and so forth. But here, we've never escaped it. To this day, we're, we do detailed combat simulations as part of our culture, as part of who we are. Um, but as I was trying to say is that we had a problem across the organization, not just for those cultural differences and the geographical differences, but we had a mindset difference where each of the centers was kind of pitted against each other, especially the, the two main ones. And uh, it wasn't healthy. And uh, I was, uh, my first job was uh, working with a great team who are trying to pull me through for the first year of a uh, uh, thing called Future Combat System. We were doing basically the AOA for that. They did it every year back then. And I could barely spell track. I thought it had a K at the end. And FCS is almost beyond my, my understanding, but it was my first job leading a study. And the great team that helped pull me through uh, helped, helped uh, me to understand how we do the work and then working through the cultural differences and all those kinds of things. At, at, the, at, the, at the action officer level, um, it wasn't as bad, but the leadership allowed it to pit each other against each other. So that's not a good thing. And so we started some years later, uh, and this is now when I became the director at, at Track White Sands, and we had a series of SDSs in place across the, the different locations uh, that saw eye to eye about a thing we call one track. It's one word, capital O N E T R A C, one word. And we started as a mantra, and it sounds silly and corny, but we started being serious about it. And even like things uh, like, like uh, an analyst down here at White Sands back in the day used to have to go all through their chain of command before they could share any of their work with somebody else in track in a different center. That's insane. Talk about barriers and silos. And so we, we started the mantra and then we started living, living what we were saying as leaders and continue to push it down. It's still a problem to this day to some degree. It's a lot less, but cultures are hard to overcome. Uh, the differences are hard to overcome. And it's something you can never let your, your, your finger off of. The pandemic was interesting for us. So um, as an organization at the time, uh, March of 20, right? Um, when we started sending folks home, uh, we had an opportunity to uh, do, still had to do studies and so forth, but we had a fairly mature organization, not a lot of brand new people, some a lot of folks that you know had been in the organization had been been together working studies uh, in terms of building relationships knowing each other helping each other and you know going through the crucible of, of, of work and so throwing everybody home wasn't such a bad it wasn't such a bad problem for us because we already had those relationships we already had those friendships and so forth um, the problem is as time goes on you start losing folks through retirement and so forth and moving you get a whole bunch of new people in. If the only thing they're seeing is a leader uh, through a screen, I think you got a problem. 
because they're not getting any sense of the culture. They're not getting a sense of who's who, and they're not building relationships and all those things that make make it so important uh, to build a team of teams. And so um, we started uh, trying to bring folks in more or early than others, probably. Uh, and also we had inherently classified work that forced us to. I probably didn't, I probably only took about two weeks of telework in the front end and a lot of our folks, uh, one of them sitting here, uh, Kevin Weiner, who ran one of our studies called Strategic Fire Study. Um, we had folks in every day of the pandemic for over a year and a half, you know, every work day and then some. And, and because of the, the nature of the work we had to do and so forth. So we had that kind of uh, end of the spectrum and we had a lot of folks that didn't come in at all. And so how do you lead an organization? Like, How do you build a team that way? And, and especially when you start losing people that know each other and know how to operate together and know your culture and know the organization. Uh, that became problematic as time went on. And so um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in telework. I wasn't, I think, when I started this, but it's got to be a hybrid and it's got to uh, evolve and change uh, over time because you can't, um, you can't replace the personal touch. You can't lead from a couch. You can't. And so there's, there's got to be some kind of balance associated with that. Yo-Yo Ma is a uh, violinist who's got a great quote, which is, music is what happens between the notes. And I, I think a corollary to that would be, trust is what happens between the meetings. It's that moment where you're at the, the proverbial water cooler and say, hey, what's going on in your, in your lane? Or you stop by somebody's cubicle. You're walking out at the end of the day if somebody else is walking out with you to the parking lot, you've never seen him before, and you learn something about him. That's so important to what we do. And so I think uh, that personal touch, and if you're gonna build any kind of team of teams, that's so fundamentally important. Uh, and it, it's something that I think uh, is, is something that will endure. So I'll go on to the next one. Communicate. Um, I had this first as an attribute communication. So like I said, you can, you can change either way, but. Um, the act of communication, uh, you can never do enough as a leader. And you've got to find multiple venues and ways to do it. You've got to uh, create a culture of trust where com real communication can happen, can come back up, you know, the truth and, and provide environments. And it's so hard to do. I mean, to this day, I, I know in, in our organization, we struggle with you know, getting truth sometimes. Some folks feel intimidated or they don't feel that they're gonna be listened to. Um, I get that. And, and no matter how many times I say, no, it's not gonna be like that, I, it's, it's, it's almost insurmountable. And so it's not just the leaders that need to communicate, it's all of us. Because team of teams is not about a real hierarchical thing. It's about having folks get together for a purpose with the relationships they need to have and execute at their level, make decisions at their level as best they can given the guidance you know, in terms of uh, sharing con shared consciousness and all the things I talked about. So um, there's really no, uh, I guess, uh, silver bullet uh, that will allow you to be able to, uh, you know, I do these things, people are, are going to get it. And so I, I, would, I would advocate for lots of different ways uh, to communicate. And so some things that we try uh, has to do with uh, town halls, for example, the pandemic, hit about a week or two later. I can't remember exactly when we started, but we started doing town halls um, every week with the entire workforce. So it was all of track together. And this was actually better than the way track was before because we we would do like uh, senior leader, you know, uh, SVTCs or VTCs across track. That's a very small audience. And then of course, what do they do? They turn and talk to their directors. And then the directors talk to the division chiefs. And then the division chiefs hopefully talk to, to, talk to the employees, right? And so now the unexpurgated uh, message was getting sent out to the workforce straight from all of us, to all the leadership. And everybody had a much better common, S, uh, common essay, in my opinion, than probably before. So it was a good thing. Um, but we did those every week for about two years. And we did everything. We try to make it interesting. I mean. Let's see how I'm doing here, but uh, we try to we try to make it interesting, and we tried very hard to um, shake it up a little bit. Like one time, uh, one of the directors, uh, we were supposed to be talking about you know all the rules about six feet and what it looks like. He did a little cartoon a set of cards where he'd show you know the stick figures and he'd show each one and, and, and he'd give a little dialogue with it. But basically, it was you know all the things about how far apart you had to be at a table and was this good and not good and pantomime a bunch of things. 
Um, I think I did a, a, a riff off of Gunga Din, the poem for, for track. Uh, we did all kinds of things, but also trying to get people in, get them interested. They never knew what we were going to do next, but also to put out information, to keep them informed of what was going on, to keep them un understanding, you know, what, what you know, their, the, the, uh, the, the latest was in terms of the, you know, the rules or what we were doing as an organization. And I think that helped. Uh, we got good press for that from the, from the workforce, but um, we don't do it every week anymore. We do it, uh, we, we kind of tapered off to every two weeks. And then more recently, probably in the last few months, uh, about once a month, we'll have a track town hall. But um, that's one way, and, and, and not the best venue. Not a lot of people raising their hand, not even sending in, you know, because you know who, they know who you are, right? And so it's still a problem. Um, one thing I used to do better than I do now is I call them walkabouts, you know, use the Australian term. Uh, military would probably call it battlefield circulation. There is, there is something extremely powerful about a leader just walking in to see somebody, one of the, one of the employees, and not going there to get something. Just say, how you doing? What's going on? What are you worried about? What are you working on? And just do that. It got to a point where I wasn't doing a good job of it, and I've told my workforce this. Um, it, it, it was so bad that I wasn't getting around. I see sort of the same people because of the work we were doing. I wouldn't get out to some of the other ones that weren't necessarily involved in the things that were the priorities at the moment. So I have a... a I asked for some uh, spreadsheet uh, sheets that show the, the layout of the two buildings we have. And it has all the names and where everybody is. And I would actually sit there and as I talked to somebody, I'd write the date and I go, yeah, I did that. And I try to work my way uh, methodically through the workforce. But again, you can't communicate enough, but you've got to have that personal touch. You've got to go out there. You've got to see folks and you've got to do it in venues where you're not always asking, hey, you have that report I was looking for? They get that enough. So, um, I would say walkabouts are, are pretty important. Um, one other thing I've tried, and this is uh, probably over the last three years, I can't remember how long I've been doing it now. Every Thursday, I send a note um, to the workforce. I call it Three Bullet Thursday. It's got three, three numbers. Uh, one is kind of the top priorities, what's going on, with a little, you know, sniglet here and there of, of different um, uh, features of the different studies we're doing, the priorities we're working on. The second one is, I guess I call it potpourri, but it's, it's always something a little different. Maybe it's a book I'm reading and when I think about it, uh, a documentary I saw or something, um, something that, some, that happened that was of interest, like I just talked earlier about our, our awards at the, the Army Operations Research Symposium. And then the last one is a quote, and I got all kinds of sources for quotes, and so I throw a quote in there. And uh, it's a way of at least providing, again, some more information at the enterprise level context you know to folks so they can understand what's going on um a chance to rib from some folks or a chance to champion some folks you know put some pictures in there say hey so and so finished baton you know and here, here's their team and those kinds of things and so it's just another way to, to, to pull together as, as a team and the last one uh is notes and and um, um one of the things i i really feel is important is a lot of a lot of folks, if they have if they're going to do, give notes to somebody for condolences to say or congratulations on, on the birth of a child, they'll have the EA, you know, print them out and then you sign them. And I've never done that because um, the note has content and, 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 and I want to express that content, whatever the occasion is. But I want them to know that I spent time thinking about them and writing it myself. So I handwrite them all and I highly recommend folks do that because, um, again, it's about that personal touch. It's, it's, um, it's not an auto pen. And so I think um, those are some ways, and there's lots of others and I haven't talked about. And one thing I did want to mention, and it shouldn't be under communication to me, maybe it's a team of teams, but you know, I'm really excited about what General Little and the team here at White Sands are doing to kind of bring the post back to life, right? Through the MWR side of the house. I try to support that. We, we encourage our folks to do it as well. That's another way to meet each other in a different way. This is tough for me because it's kind of one way probably tough for you, but to go out, you know, and, and hit the club and watch a football game together, you know, and, and meet some folks from across the command and across the different tenant units. So important. So uh, I'll move on to the last of the uh, actions that I want to talk about. And um, I came across this. Uh, well, first of all, what I mean by this learn outside your lane is too often, we, 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 if we're going to look at something and research it, it's because we're interested. 
or because we're good at it and we want to learn more about it or something like that. You know, as a as an infantry officer, I look back on my self-education. Army did a good job of different things, but my self-education was pretty narrow. I read military history. I read biographies of military leaders. And yes, I, I hate to admit, sometimes I read doctrine. Uh, and so that's kind of what, what I was doing. And I look back on that and I didn't change it really until later in my career, but you should, you should try to learn things outside your lane, your outside things that you know well. Read about philosophy, read about biology, read about psychology, especially as a leader, to understand not only what's going on in everybody's heads, but your problems with biases, you know, the things that you almost can't get out of. There's a book by uh, Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. If you ever wanna read a book about biases and, and uh, he called it system one thinking, which is kind of your on the Serengeti reaction based upon cues and system two, which is that longer arduous, high energy thinking through a problem. And he talked about a whole host of biases and all his analysis he's done and if you if you go through all that book and it's worth it, he said at the end, you can't get outside your biases. So as a leader, you need to know what they are. You need to be cognizant of them. You need to continue to remind yourself. But uh, the Learn Outside Your Lane really came from a, a book uh, by, uh, it's called Poor Charlie's Almanac. Uh, anybody ever heard of Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, any own stock? Um, there's, a, there's another gentleman behind him called uh, Charlie Munger who's a who's a very interesting individual. And there's a, a book that's been pulled together of some of his talks that he's given uh, over the years. And it's a, it's a big book with all kinds of pictures and stuff like that. Good for an infantryman to read. But um, I have a uh, maybe guy laughs. I have um, um, but 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 one of the things in there is talked about the mental models that he uses. If you think about it, you know, a lot of us, if we if we um, have a uh, what is it? If we see a nail and have a hammer, I got it backwards. But anyway, you, you usually use the things you're comfortable with to solve a problem. And what Charlie Munger does is he takes a, a whole lattice of mental models and he then applies them uh, to a problem, but he's looking at it from different dimensions. So it might be some kind of mathematical relationship. And it might be something about psychology and it might be something, you know, whatever. It's a whole bunch of broad different fields. And he's got about, he says in the, the write-up, about 12 to 13 different mental models that then he, he doesn't apply them all every time, but the ones that, that apply and give him different perspectives on the goodness or not of investing in a company, for example, he applies them all together in a disciplined way. That's pretty profound. And I'm an analyst and I didn't really think about that until I read that. That's pretty sad. But um, I think it's all part of us getting outside of ourselves, getting back to the bias thing. You, you, you can't help fight your biases until you look at things from another perspective. The same thing with you know how you solve problems. If you keep using the same technique and you apply the same tools every time, you're going to get the same result. And you may, it'll probably be too narrow and it won't be a very good one. And so learn outside your lane, I think, is uh, the, the thing I'd say there. Um, oh my God, I'm going slow. Sorry. I'll move on. Okay, some attributes. And, and again, this is just my opinion. And I got three, so I'm going to talk fairly quickly about these. So. Credibility um, is something that will take your entire career to achieve, and you can lose it in an instant, right? Um, there's a little equation, I think it's either in Team of Teams or another great book, Good to Great, uh, by Jim Collins. And the e equation says basically credibility is your, e equals your, your uh, uh, proven competence, integrity, and relationships. And I'll use an example of a recent great leader, I think, personally, Queen Elizabeth II just passed away, right, um, uh, last week, and uh, and it was kind of interesting that the our, our, our British uh, UK fr uh, friends were here uh, this week on Monday, so it is fresh in their minds, and and it's it's a, a hugely emotional event for them. Think about the fact that they haven't had a change of leadership in 70 years. And think about our every two year to four year you know cycles that we go through. So this is a this is a, a jolt to them for lots of reasons, obviously. But uh, Queen Elizabeth, um, in terms of you know the uh, proven competence, I think that goes without saying. A very steady hand uh, as a leader of the UK for for se over 70 years. Um, integrity. Uh, there's there's 
there's I have never heard anything uh, that would impugn her integrity in, in all the readings and the news I've ever seen. And in relationships, and I said this at the beginning of our, our uh, IPR kickoff with the British, I keep saying British, the UK involved. And um, it turns out 9-11, of course, this is past Sunday. And the day after 9-11, the, the actual event, um, Queen Elizabeth parted with 400 years of tradition. And she had the Coldstream Guards during the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace, play the Star Spangled Banner. Never done that before. And then they did it again at the St. Paul's Cathedral during services that, that Sunday. And then she did it again last year. Not to commemorate, but to remember the 20 year anniversary of, of the terrorist attacks. I think that built a relationship with our country and our leaders? I think so. So, um, just to close on the credibility thing, it's, it's very difficult to achieve and so easy to lose. You know, and I'd, add a, I'd add a penalty term from a mathematical perspective to that equation I gave you in terms of your, your proven competence, integrity, and relationships. And I put minus 10 to the hundredth times a lapse in judgment or something, because it's all it takes to, to completely wash it all away. I'm gonna actually combine these two. And this comes from uh, Humility and Will comes from a book called Good to Great, I mentioned a second ago. And um, it, it was called in the book, Level Five Leadership. So you got basic, as you kind of move up the echelon or on the, in the enterprise, you have basic things. Can I lead myself? You know, do I know myself? Can I lead teams? And you kind of move up. Level five was a distinguishing characteristic in the study that this book did, uh, I think it was early 2000s, um, where it was almost like analysis of alternatives. So you had, you had the, the, the good, the sort of okay companies that they used, and then they, had, they did a very, very detailed process to figure out which ones were great. And then they compared the two lists and they said, what makes those great, great compared to the good? And of course they kept the same sectors, you know, so if it was a, you know, the steel industry, you had a, a more mediocre and, and good one versus a steel industry a company that was in, in the great. And Jim Collins is an interesting dude. If you ever want to um, uh, have, he's a fascinating individual, but um, he was, um, adamant that he had a team working on this for over a year, gathering the data, making the comparisons. I do not want you to come back and tell me it's leadership. Don't want you to do that. And they kept coming back, hey, I think it's leadership. I do not, you know, and they did this for months. And, and finally the data showed that they were right. It is group that was doing the analysis. And the thing that distinguished, at least at the top level, let's take CEOs of companies and so forth, that distinguished the good from the great was, was leaders that had humility and will. Humility and will. And you think about those and you think, wow, that's those kind of, those, there's a duality there, right? Like, you know, you could say humility sounds like meek and shy and will sounds strong and fierce, right? Well, yes and no. But every one of the leaders that were leading those companies, they were very different people. They weren't Lee Iacocca saying, here I am, here I am, I'm wonderful. Um, in fact, the, the company that he ran as a CEO use his name, it had an acronym, the first word was I, it says I am, you know, Chrysler's whatever, they, they're making fun of him because it was all about him. But the humility and will piece is about, not about yourself, it's about the organization. Um, when you become a leader, you, you give up your own self-interest, or you should. It's about the team, it's about the group. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's kind of a, a paradigm in the book about window versus mirror. And so a, uh, a level five leader or a great company leader, um, when, when uh, something good happens, is looking out the window to see who to congratulate out there. And then when thing, something bad happens, looking in the mirror for responsibility. Leaders that are not so good, when they, something good happens, they're looking in the mirror. Yeah, I did that. And they look out the window to see who to blame. And so uh, the duality of that, and I think uh, the the humility piece, especially, was hard for me. You know, being an infantry officer, humility is not a not a strong trait amongst folks, at least when I was younger. And I kind of learned some of this later, and I'm working on it. I'm a work in progress, and I, I, I'll tell you that uh, straight up. But um, I think uh, between the humility and the will is the fixity of purpose. There's a thing called a Stockdale pa a paradox. Paradox. Admiral Stockdale was a prisoner of war many years in, in Vietnam. Um, Medal of Honor winner because of how he comported himself. But it's the, the duality is you got to face the brutal facts. But at the same time, 
you got to have a fixity of purpose or a or a, a a profound certainty that you're going to get through it. And that's what he had. But but facing the facts can kind of depress you. If you're in a Vietnamese prison. Uh, but but having the faith and the fortitude to continue on, which he did, uh, those two things together are very powerful. Um, I'm going to conclude here, and uh, I'll I'll stop. Or I'll, I'll end with what I said at the beginning. People are born and leaders are made. Every one of us in this room could be a better leader. Um, it takes um, some work, obviously, uh, but there's so many opportunities, and it's not just by your position. By the way, you're, you're, you're a manager by position, you're a leader by your people. And so um, all of us have, in different walks of life, uh, opportunities, and all of us have uh, an ability uh, to have an impact on our communities, our workplace, our families, or whatever it is. And our country needs that. Our army needs that kind of leadership. And I would say, um, certainly, your organizations, our organizations need that as well. These are tough times. It's a very volatile world we're in. And things have gotten much more interdependent, which that plus the speed of, of movement of information creates complexity. And so leadership is never needed more. There's a quote that I'll end with um, from Aristotle that says, we are what we routinely do. Excellence then is not an act, but it's a habit. And so make a habit of excellence in your lives. Take a, a, a shot at just improving incrementally different areas of your leadership, you know, find the gaps in your leadership swing and so forth. People are born leaders, excuse me, people are born and leaders are made. And so I think uh, if, if you ha have some, a little bit of work on some of these actions I talk about, look at the, the different aspects of attributes, maybe in your own uh, personal uh, perspective and keep working on that. And, and above all, we're all in this together as a command, as co-workers, human beings, Americans, you name it. Um, take that opportunity to be a leader and all leaders should be about inspiring people. So go out there and inspire some folks. So I'll, I'll uh, end there. I'll give you a little bonus from uh, Theodore Geisel, uh, AKA Dr. Seuss and some great stuff. And then I'll take any questions, although I think I've gone a little longer than I thought, but I think we started late, so I'll stop. Question. Yes, ma'am. So you discussed your reflection on leadership during your tenure. However, if you look back, you look current to today's leaders. If you could only pick one, what would be considered the most significant trait that would hinder a leader's career? A trait to, that would hinder? Mm -hmm. If you only pick one, I, one I think integrity. And and the re the reason I say that is um, it's because it, it leads to other things that are really important as leader, the trust of others. It's it's kind of tied to competence as well. It's tied to a lot of things. And uh, so I, I would say integrity there. Uh, the word comes from uh, Latin in, integer, which means whole. And it used to be the Roman uh, soldiers would stand up there with their armor on and everything. And as as the uh, the troop in the line would happen, they would strike their armor, you know, and, and, and yell something probably, you know, motivational. Uh, to the leadership but the point was striking that armor the sound of it told them if they were taking care of it uh, told the leaders that and it was also a, an, a, an attestation of the individual soldier that i i'm whole i'm ready and so uh, i think integrity would be the one i would say I have one more question. sure um it seems like there's never enough hours in a day so mm -hmm. as a leader how do you strike a balance between uh, taking care of uh, futures focus, thinking and planning versus taking care of current tasks. I'm not doing a good job. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest, I got up at 3.30 this morning to uh, partly do this, but I had, uh, you know, because of the work we're doing, you, you, you have to use the fringes of the day to catch up on all the stuff that still comes in all day long, and so I was behind. Um, that is a great question. Um, part of it is, uh, I, I think, process-oriented. Part of it is having others help you, you know, do a better job of that balance. Um, I'm not very good at it, but uh, I've seen some who are good and, and, and what they do, and it's hard and it takes a little bit of effort, but they really focus, and Jim Collins, the, the guy I was talking about wrote that book, but they, they really focus on what absolutely has to get done and then they cut some more. And so they, they, they uh, will not do a lot of different things that most leaders would do. 
because it's not important to the overall enterprise at the time. And, um, and so that kind of like discipline, you know, I think is probably one way to do it better. But then you have to have all those other pieces I was talking about. You have to have a team that doesn't need all that care and feeding or a team that understands why you're not doing that. So it's, it's complicated, but I'll just tell you, I'm not, a, I'm not a good example of that. Total work in progress there. So thanks for the questions. I think we've, uh, oh, Sean. So <clears throat> we're really trying to focus the pants here and here on, on leader development. What are some of the things that you guys are doing over the chat um, to encourage and to uh, develop your at all levels? So we're doing a lot of things. And some of it's, you know, programmatics, if you will, like, uh, you know, we, uh, we have a fairly uh, comprehensive onboarding with we call it the track analyst development program. So it's kind of our norms and standards, how where we fit in the army, what kind of work we do, what a study looks like, you know, those kinds of things. So that that piece. Uh, and then we also have greening, which allows, you know, especially our, our young civilian analysts to come in and, and roll around in a Bradley or a tank or something like that, talk to soldiers and get an understanding of context. Those aren't leader development per se, but they they build a foundation for especially for the newer folks. Um, going, uh, coming to the organization who know nothing about the Army. Um, but the leader development, I think, happens in a lot of different ways uh, from my perspective. And one of them is, um, one, I think one of the secret sauces of our organization is the strong teaming between the military and the civilian analysts. And, and the military are coming usually after, you know, their company command, and then uh, they're on their first ORSA assignment, typically. So been out of school for a while. A little, little bit of cobwebs probably, you know, for, for you know, the, the, the kind of work and the, and the education they had before. Um, the analysts, the young analysts are coming in, they're just smart as heck. I mean, they're, they're coming in and they, they just got a degree usually, and they're just really sharp. And the, 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 the teaming between those two, the, the uh, integration of those two is powerful because the one can say, Here, here's what the Army's like, and provide context for Army and for our work. And, here, and the other one can say, hey, now, here's a new technique we're using in Python. I don't even know how to do anything in Python, but they do that. Uh, and so um, that's another thing I think that because there's leadership there, the military, usually pretty seasoned leaders, right? Been in the army for a few years uh, and the civilian, a lot of junior civilian analysis, this first job ever just came out of school. So th there, there's a piece of leader development that happens almost naturally and informally that's really magical. Um, then moving up though, and uh, I've got, uh, we, we have got a lot of uh, new leadership at, at Track White Sands. Uh, we had a uh, a pretty large uh, spate of retirements from senior, you know, GS-15 level, GS-14s and so forth over the last two years, like significant. And the directors that I kind of came in with are gone, with one exception, one hanger on. Um, but, um, but so we have a lot of new leadership and I'm beginning to realize I'm expecting them to know all the things that the other directors knew and that's not fair. And so I got to do some work uh, when I get done with Project Convergence here in two months. Well, I won't be done then, but anyway, uh, to, to kind of help build that team and, and get them the understanding of what, what it is that, I, that matters to me. What's the CCIR to me? You know, what decisions are theirs? What decisions may not be theirs and how we want to interact? Haven't been able to do that yet. And so that's something else I would do. And the last, I guess I would say in, in the, the leader development side is as a study house, we do lots of studies and we have lots of opportunities, even for junior analysts, to get leadership roles. Even though you're not running the whole study, you can be a leader of a subset of it. For example, you're the lead now for the, the modeling and simulation we're gonna do. You gotta deliver, you gotta present it. You know, you, you gotta do all that and you gotta lead a team to do that. A lot of what TRAC does is that, that teaming piece because of the nature of work we do, pulls in organizations from across the army, across the joint force and lately across the world, right? Uh, with our allies. And so our ability to, to lead, to, to build and lead teams is really important. And so all of our analysts get a shot at that at some point because they're leading some aspect of it and they have to figure that out. You know, I always say that um, when you lead organizations like that, you have no cudgel. You can't beat them with a stick. You have to cajole. And so you got to build teams. Last night, uh, we were down in uh, Si Senores with uh, you know, a whole bunch of the folks from our, our conference. Uh, to include our, our UK friends and others, uh, the joint staff folks were there, everybody. We we're just having dinner together. And I think we probably made more, more ground there with, you know, the, that team 
uh, than we probably did in, the, in the, the previous three days of the hostage crisis here, as I always call it. So, um, but, but I think, you know, again, it, it, every level is different, but I, uh, our work program allows lots of opportunities for that. Kind of, and then you got to have something a little more formal. OJT is a, a piece of it, right? But you, you have to have more formal, you know, injects with uh, different aspects of, of the organization. Talk about, you know, what's, what's going right, what's not going right. Talk about shared consciousness type stuff, the things I've been talking about today. So I don't know if I completely answered that. There's just some ideas. Sir. Sir, I got a question for you. I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm an ATEC Inspector General. I agree with yesterday. One of our continuing issues we have within ATEC seems to be communication, like my number one case study that we have. <clears throat> I too was an engineer. I came in a little bit after you in 1984. And the standard, the standard comment I used to get when I used to want to voice my opinion to shut your mind hole, you'll care what you have to say. <laughs> but uh, as you get, as you grow into the, into the system, you learn that everybody has an ability. But you mentioned something I thought was interesting with the barriers and silos. And I think we have a problem with barriers and silos. Now, some of it is, you know, as within the organization you work in, and others is in, you know. Oh, they're um, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what are some of the suggestions since we got a majority of the leadership here in here? How can we help break down those barriers and silos? Well, um, it can't just be done at work. You got to, I always say work hard, play hard. You got to, you know, go, go to some of these other events, you know, and, or um, have an, uh, uh, not even an offsite, but have, have some of the, the, the teams you get together on the outside of work. I think that's really powerful. And you, you kind of build a team and, and communicate better in dog years, not, not, you know, one year at a time. And it's, it's much more effective. Um, as, an, as a complementary uh, aspect. But breaking down barriers and silos is really, 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 really hard. Um, because every, every organization feels like, yeah, they don't, they don't get it. It's always the they, right, across the way. And, um, and so you gotta first start with that, you know. Um, I'm, I'm sure that in our team that we're building here for Project Convergence, you know, it's over 300 analysts across the world, essentially. Um, we got a lot of problems with barriers. So we, we spent three days just talking about some of those between, you know, uh, the different services and, and even within the army, my God, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. I, I, I don't have any silver bullet for you, but I would say, um, it's, it's, uh, you can't communicate enough. You can't, you can't, um, bring folks together enough and work through problems, but you got to set that culture. You got to set that, that expectation where, Hey, we're going to solve this together. We're going to stop worrying about where we're from or who we are and start worrying about who we are now as this larger team or this larger enterprise. And there's so many ways to do that. Lots of different things you can do. But like I say, it's got to be both at work and outside of work. And it's got to be continuous, persistent and supported by all the leadership. You can't have a few, you know, within uh, leaders that are that are not on board. If they're not on board. They need to probably go somewhere else in the organization if you want to get the team together. Um, and, you know, I, I've talked about some things you could do to help build the teams more, but the communication thing, it's, it's, it's a never ending task, not a bad task. It's just something you've got to be thinking about all the time. Um, work, I, I work more with ATAC and I've been on this post for quite a while in the last two years than I have in the preceding, whatever, 10 something, 12 something. So, um, yeah, I'm learning a lot about your culture. I'm learning a lot about how you operate. Um, I'm learning even the difference between OT and DTs and stuff like that. Uh, but um, we are fundamentally different because of our, our you know, why we exist. And um, we're in different commands. Um, you know, we have, we have, we have different uh, cultures, different standards, different kinds of work, right? But uh, I've learned a lot about what, all you, what, what it is that all you do, especially, especially at the ranges from the test perspective because of what we have to do in project convergence. And we're starting to make gains together, you know, in terms of understanding each other and knowing what, you know, what to render under the ATEC team versus what to render under the DAC team, you know, the data analysis center from DEVCOM or, or whoever. And uh, the only way I see making that work is to continue to uh, 
dialogue, set standards where, you know, we're all in this together and, um, you know, and then do the work. That's that's next for us. So pulling everybody together and, and executing. But I, I don't think I gave you a very good answer, but it's something that to me, you just can't oh, let's do that and then I'll fix it. And it ain't that way. And then and then after you do you have a relationship with an organization like every year in PC Project Convergence, you know, there's a whole new team next year. You're starting over. So uh, you got to kind of re, re rewalk, retrod some of the ground. So, yeah. Sir. Yeah. With respect to barriers and silos, I think that the existence of barriers and silos is an indication that we don't have the enough uh, collaboration uh, or different uh, objectives or goals. If we don't have the collaboration, we will we'll end up with barriers and silos. They will start lacking trust among uh, those uh, address notes, those uh, goals. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that uh, facilitating collaboration, establishing collaboration for any purpose, will eliminate the barriers and silos. I agree. I'm an office of one, so I have no barriers. <laughs> <laughs> That you're willing to admit to. <laughs> well, I, that's a good point. I mean, yeah, I, uh, I didn't talk about collaboration. I got a little behind time, I thought. But um, you know, collaboration um, is not something I did naturally because, because of my upbringing in the Army, honestly. Uh, when, I, when I first came to track, you know, I, I, I kind of operated like I was still in a military unit, you know, making decisions. You know, I'm listening, but at the same time, okay, it's on me. And, and that changed as I started working in the organization over the years. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the collaboration part, though, has to have the foundation of all those other things we talked about, the right respect, trust, you know, those, those relationships, uh, you know, the what happens between the meetings and all those kinds of things. But collaboration uh, is easier in some ways, right, with the, the tools we have. But the tools aren't enough. It's, it's a mindset. And it's also an atmosphere and environment that leadership has to set so that 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 collaboration can happen truly. It's 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 not just you know being able to talk to each other on the teams. It's, it's also having to be able to collaborate as a team to accomplish a purpose, right? Rounds complete. Yeah. Okay. I think they are. Okay. They're done. Thank you. Gary, thank you for sharing those thoughts with us. I got a lot out of it. Well, I appreciate the time and thought that you put into it. It's very clear that this was not all the cuss. You, you gave us a good part of yourself. Thanks. And uh, General Little couldn't be here today. He's on the TVY mission. I uh, feel his pain. <laughs> and, yeah, Command Sergeant Major Melendez. But on behalf of him and myself and the entire Wisdom team, we would like to present you with a Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate your time too. I really do, and uh, it's a hot place in here, but you, you stuck you stuck it like chance. And so, thanks thanks for your attention. Mm -hmm.